Howdy once again, it's Tubal Cain, your YouTube shop teacher. And this is episode number 36 of my This and That series. Now, I've been fairly prolific lately, if I dare say so myself. And not in terms of, uh, of numbers of videos, but I, I have been in the shop a lot. Anyway, uh, these are some of the projects. Don't worry about this one, no one watched that. But I did recently make the dynamo, and there'll be a video with it being driven here by the little Stewart engine. But most recently, I did this uh, uh, drill press vise, and it seems like a lot of people like that. But that brought me to yet another subject, and then I talked about my uh, Peterson products here and the foundry patterns I used to make. But with the help of Kevin in New Jersey, I'm going to reenact some of that. And he sent me already the 3D files that I needed to make up this original vise. This is exactly the one I just showed you on that sheet, only this is half scale. So I'm working on a full scale one as well. And you might hear the printer droning in the, in the background, and I know that most people don't like that. But the purpose of this is to show how uh, to make, and it'll be six and a half inches long, the full size one. Then I'm going to cast it up, but I'm trying to prove here to myself and maybe others that, in fact, rather than make those patterns out of plaster like I did so many years ago, if I was going to run that business today, which I have no intentions of doing because I'm 75 years old, but I probably would sell or give away the 3D files so that they could be printed out as foundry patterns. Notice that this is tapered, and it's kind of cute in that half size, isn't it? See, that's only about three inches long, but the final one will be six inches. And by the way, follow me, if you will, on Instagram, and my name is Mr. Pete 222 So that's the preliminary. I've got a lot of things to cover in this episode, including viewer appreciation gifts. So let's get on with it. First off, let's have a little quiz here, and if you have an answer for this, put it in the comments. I don't know if you will or not, but these are two real old vice grips here, but this one is exceptionally old. Old enough to where it does not have the quick release here. And I'm not sure exactly when they came up with that, and, you know, this was a real knuckle buster before they came up with this. And, and it's, in fact, it still can be. And I believe the Stanley brand has a better system than, than did Vice Grips. But what year did they go from this model to this model? Also notice that in this real old one here, that this is, it's either welded. Yeah, it must be welded because it's a stamping. But you can see the way that's made. And then later on, they cheapened it and went to this method. But looking here at a real old ad in Popular Mechanics, and I'm not going to show you the date on that. Notice that was the Peterson manufacturer, and they made them out in uh, uh, Nebraska. But it, it, that's the old one. And boy, some guy would like to get that for Christmas. Man, oh man. So... Put down in the comments if you know. I do not know exactly myself, but I have a, a pretty good inkling of the approximate era. All right. Recently, I got a nice box here from Tom McAllister. He's down in Alabama, and he said he lives uh, in the buckle of the Bible Belt. I'm not sure exactly where that, uh, what he means by that or exactly where. But inside of this box, there are many, many items and I'm going to take them out of the bags and lay them here. I'm not going to go over every one. He tells what they're for. They're really for watch repair, watch making. But I think that he gave it to me in the interest of repairing dial indicators because he saw me struggling with that. So these are some of the things that a fellow would need to repair sluggish dial indicators. So let me open these up. I'm not, I don't want to spend uh, too much time on this because I could spend 15 minutes on this alone. But I will not. Thank you very much for this, Tom, and I suppose Tom, I don't know if he said so or not, whether he's a repairman or what, but extremely tiny screwdrivers here, much smaller than some that I have seen in the past, so there's a selection of those, a whole handful of tweezers of all kinds, and these are little oilers. You wouldn't believe how little they are. Now, they are empty at this time, but just minute little oilers in, in different sizes. But in this 
package and it got kind of messy. Something leaked in there, but there's grease, apparently two different kinds of grease and several different kinds of oil that would go into those little oilers you see there. And then this, he kind of made fun of this, but he said it's an old cheap old piece of junk uh, demag uh, demagnetizer. Yeah, that's what it is. But you have to demagnetize some of those parts. And then in this package are the little the tools used to remove needles off of the little pinion shafts. And then five or six other things here. I won't take the time because the video is already getting too long. But thank you, Tom, very much for this. And I do have a bunch of sluggish indicators, but I do not have the eyesight to do it. Several years ago, I made a video showing how I caught moles in my yard. I've had a lot of problems with the moles, but I didn't have any last year for some reason. But here, out of the clear blue sky from Mount Juliet, Tennessee, Joe DeFira sent me a mole trap. And he said it's the greatest one ever. He also sent me a little video of how to use it. And he sent two of these. They were drop shipped from Rural King. The first one appeared to have been lost in the mail. I mean, so here it is. And. Uh, looks like an interesting device that catches them, I believe, around the abdomen. Now I will not show a follow-up video on this because, uh, believe it or not, I had an awful lot of negative mail because I killed a mole. So I suppose somebody uh, would, would also object it if, to it if I killed a, a mouse or, or a rat or, or a spider. So that looks like a nice piece here. And I will set that in the yard at the first sign of moles when the, the ground is soft. We have a lot of them here in central Illinois. I don't know if you do where you, where you live. But thank you very much, Joe, for sending this along and going to all the expense and effort of that. And it's probably at least a $20 trap. I'm at the Bridgeport, and this is a follow-up to these two videos I made at uh, one time, not too long ago, but at the time of 11... 25 you'll see that there was damage inside of here and I made fun of Bubba saying I'm wondering how he could possibly have damaged it internally like that well somebody pointed out to me that at one point I think this vice had been downgraded and just used in a welding shop to hold the work while they welded it and apparently Bubba put the ground clamp right here on the screw so the current had to have a way to get through all the grease and oil and from the uh, moving parts to the stationary parts so it'll take whatever is the easiest path of course and some of that arcing that you saw inside there and you can go back and look at that video if you want was obviously caused by welding so that's what happened that's all of the mystery I thought that was really interesting did you see the recent video where Jim Kohler gave me this big Wilton Vice and it weighs about 45 pounds and of course the naysayers immediately said you can't use that on this relatively small vice because the all the weight will cause too much deflection and bending of the table so let's do a measurement on that now and see if they were right or they are wrong take a guess before I do this how much did 45 pounds cause this to move in the uh, in the down position so I'll put give me a minute here while I put the uh, the Noga on there so the Noga base is fastened onto the quill and looking down here at the Mitutoyu let me bring that on to zero right there now I've clamped and I will set the vise up here the 45 pound vise Got to move the camera or something here. Okay, watch the indicator here as I lift this vice in the place, and boy, is that heavy! And it looks like it moved what? About five thousandths. And it's still fluttering, isn't it? But that's the way to that. Now, I consider the five thousandths insignificant because a drill press is not that. Uh, important of a, of a machine as a milling machine is. So five thousandths out of square now is what we got and I think that is minimal 
Now let me put some body weight on this and let's see if it moves even more. And it does. Wow. When I, I don't know how many pounds I'm putting there, but you can see I can flex it. So those people were correct, but I still am not going to worry about it. But normally we don't put a 45 pound vise on a relatively sensitive drill press, but thought maybe you might find that interesting. I did. I think most of you know that Banggood is one of my sponsors, and I thank them for the stuff that they sent me. And I recently got these items, and one of these here is a half center carbide tipped, and you already saw me use that when I made the thread for this. Why the half center? Because it gives more clearance in there for the tools and all that, and I had never had a carbide tipped one, and I used it as a dead center. Of course, immediately people pointed out that, well, why didn't you use a live center? Well, I'm experimenting, that's why. And then this is just, uh, well, that's the number uh, two half center, also carbide tipped. And these are pretty uh, inexpensive, really. I've, and here's just a number two dead center. So I needed an extra one of those. Well, finally, the threading inserts came. Because I had ordered uh, the holders here a long time ago, and the inserts were back ordered. So finally I got those, and you also saw me, I have several of these, you saw me use it again in threading this, so it worked out pretty nice. Thank you Banggood, and thank you for watching. Some time ago I showed you this ad here, that was from Popular Mechanics, I think back in the 60s, but there is a man using a Nicholson file, and I, I just posed the question, what is he doing wrong, because he's actually doing several things wrong. Number one, he's not wearing safety glasses, but mainly what I wanted to point out here is that the way he's holding this lawnmower blade in the vise, that thing would vibrate like a tuning fork. I think you can all imagine that, and it looks like he's holding it really in the wrong position. I can't tell. The vice jaws are real wide, so he's holding it in a funny position. So this was all set up by a model. That guy's not a machinist. He's a model. And the people on Madison Avenue that did the pictures, you know, they were clueless. So, uh, and the other thing is, who would ever actually use a file to, to try? You'd ruin the file on that hard material. You need to use a grinder, and furthermore, most people throw their blades away and get a new one for seven dollars, and, and don't do that because that file, that long, that's a 12-inch file or 14-inch file. That's a fifteen-dollar file, which would cost more than the blade. So those are my observations on that. What do you think? All right, get ready for your heart to flutter. I was over at my brother-in-law's house about 25 miles from here, and he retired from Caterpillar about five years ago. And he said, uh, uh, I got a couple things for you. So we went into his shop, which is mainly a wood shop, and there, believe it or not, I was shocked that he had two Kennedy chests. And he starts rooting through them. He says, I got a bunch of things for you. So really, this is all he could find. He said he had calipers and all kinds of other things, but I thought, well, that's a micrometer, but it doesn't weigh anything. So inside of there, and I don't think this ever got used, remember that everything at Caterpillar was uh, metric, is metric. I don't think this was used because it's just perfect. And, you know, I don't think this shows up too well uh, in the video. But if that color case hardening doesn't make your heart flutter, then there's something wrong with you and you're not watching the right videos here. But that's pretty awesome. Now I got umpteen of these, but I did not own any in metric. So I was really glad to get that and, and brand new with that in the box. Now what's in the other box? So, you know, I, I think I'll show you that this is the depth gauge. I like to find them in a the box like this. The boxes are pretty well worn from being in the toolbox. There's all the original paperwork, and this is a two-inch metric. I take it back, it's not metric, it's imperial, thank goodness. And it's got the lock here. It's got, well, it's not vernier, doesn't matter. 
very nice condition except he does have his initials here on the back just a tiny little spot of corrosion there but it does zero out nicely he did not have the the standard in there but I do have several standards and I, why there are two of the wrenches I don't know but it does zero out and that's a a nice unit. I'm glad it's not a one inch because I got umpteen one inchers. Now at Caterpillar you were able to buy your tools through the uh, tool room. So does not have carbide anvils but it's, but it's a nice unit. Beautiful satin chrome, beautiful sterret boxes. So my heart was fluttering and then he said well I got some more stuff but I can't find it right now he said but I may have given it to somebody else so I don't know if there'll be any more forthcoming but thank you for that Phil by the way I'm finally finished with the Logan's course that's 41 chapters you'll find that in one of my promotions if you got a Logan lathe but I'm going to talk now about Atlas lathes and I have told you repeatedly that the Atlas Craftsman book here is more comprehensive and I think far better than the South Bend book but what surprised me just recently just weeks ago a man in Canada I believe it's from Canada Canada guy Codron sent me uh, PDF files of this Atlas quick change attachment lathe book now we've got here oh I don't know so I'll only print it on one side. I think there's like 75 pages here of gearing information on the Atlas lathe. I had no idea this existed. He has the original and I believe if I'm correct that he now he sent this down to uh, Keith Rucker so this should be on vintage machinery if you ever need it. Now there's a lot and this is for the 10 inch it probably applies to the 12 inch since this was printed in 47 they hadn't come out with the 12 inch yet there's a nice letter from Guy uh, to me and in, it, in this there's a copyright 47 there are tables pages and pages and pages but they start out with telling you how to uh, set the quick change gearbox there's a table of contents and uh, talking about all the change gears and the possibilities of all the different possible feeds and threads many many more than you're going to find in the book and many many more than what you need but as you get near the end of this and it goes on forever You know, and some of you out there always thought of Atlas as kind of a, a home shop lathe, not a commercial one. But, you know, here are setups for winding enamel covered magnet wire for coils. And here's for uh, winding with brown and sharp sizes. And winding with the Washburn and Mowen <laughs> wire gauge and cotton covered magnet wire and just on and on and on and even though I probably won't use this I just thought it fascinating and I'm really pleased that Guy went to the effort of sending this down so now it is in the archives of vintage machinery can be downloaded by anybody that would have a notion or at least take a look at that if you will and thank you Guy ever so much for sending this to me and thank you even more for putting it on vintage machinery because I, I've been around a long time and never heard of this this, uh, this book and it was probably spiral bound so thank you guy okay the day after Phil gave me these two sterret tools I came home and on the kitchen counter there's yet another sterret box that a friend had brought over for me I'll save that because the video is too long we won't talk about that now but I was down in Bloomington visiting my buddy Dan who was uh, like a college roommate and he's got a little shop and he's a kind of an extraordinary man but he, he was cleaning out I told him we took these industrial arts classes uh, teacher training together but uh, he, he said do you want these books I said well sure so this is American Foundrymen's Society and I th Sandreimer if you're watching us you know this is <coughs> more down your line but this book is really way 
1957 edition, way too technical with charts and graphs and metallurgy and, and stuff like that. It's really not something that that I do, but this is probably a, a real, it's almost an engineering work, so set that aside. But these books here are metalworking books. These, these would have been used, these two books here, in beginning metalworking class. I don't mean machine shop, but metalworking. And I did use this one when I was teaching, but uh, those books are probably long gone. But uh, oh, there's the original catalog from uh, Goodhart Wilcox, the publisher. I didn't even see that till just now. And oh, this would have been given to uh, Dan then. We often got free books back then because teachers did. Look at that school price was four eighty. Now it would be seventy five dollars for a book like this. Anyway, uh, these books show pretty interesting metalworking projects and, you know, everything from foundry to machine shop to sheet metal to handwork was all covered in these beginning books. None of this is being taught anymore, but it was really good stuff. This one, very similar, again, metalworking, but the same man, Willard McCarthy, was my teacher and working on some of these books while I was a student there. This was it. That's where I went to college. You could rent books there, super cheap, and then sell them back. This again is all metalworking. Now this one is the one that Mr. McCarthy, what a wonderful man he was. He just died about three years ago, almost at the age of, of uh, 95. And he was writing these books because McKnight McKnight was a local publisher. And we visited them on a field trip, not too far from the school, a couple miles from the school. And, uh, oh, there's my buddy's name on it, Dan Harms. So, and he, oh, he had two of these when we were there, two identical ones. And he, I said, you're going to give me all these books? And he kind of paged through and, oh, no, I'm going to keep this one. And it was signed by Willard McCarthy. So, and this is a machine shop book, not a metalworking book. And... I did use a uh, edition of this, not this exact edition, when I was teaching machine shop. But you know, you had a heck of a time getting kids to, to read a book. They just had no interest in that. And finally, here's an engineering graphics that's uh, drafting. Uh, but anyway, these three books here, since I have books so similar to this, I'm sending these down to Adam Booth who seems to like these old textbooks, so I don't know if you're watching Adam, but you're going to get these three in the mail here as soon as I get around to mailing them. Now, while I was still at Dan's house, and we did some field trips while we were down there, he took me around town and showed me a few things, but for Christmas he got from his wife, his lovely wife, a, and he lives in a beautiful house, far better than what I got. <laughs> he owns a lot of rental property. So, in his garage, he's got a grizzly milling machine given to him by his wife. It's one of the smaller, lighter duty ones. But I did take just a short video with my phone, so I'm going to add that right to the end here. You can watch that if you want. We're not operating it, but I'm just kind of showing it off because it's under power. So uh, that concludes the video, other than that clip of the grizzly mill. And if I did not mention items that you sent me or I omitted something, that should be upcoming in another one as it is. The, this is a horrendously long video. So now we're going to clip to Bloomington, Illinois, to, to Dan's uh, garage. Uh, th thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. This is Tubal Cain saying so long for now. Okay, here I am in Dan's garage. There won't be any appreciable sound on this video. There's the model number.